Eleanor, what would you like to select? 219? Not 219. I'm getting mixed signals. 299, 299, all right. I'm sure 219 is good. I'm sure it's good. But we'll go to 299. And we can sing a cappella. Oh, thank you, Petra. And my dear wife. 299, of course. Joy to the world. Well, we must stand for this one. Let's stand. Oh, 
cause our faith to rise, cause our eyes to see your majestic love and authority. Come thou long expected Jesus. 
gives us more to say. Thy people free from our fears and sins release us. Let us find our rest in Thee. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth thou art. Dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart, joy to chapter 1 tonight. Considering what we see here regarding sacrifice to the Word of God. But I will read, starting at the beginning, of 1 Samuel 1. After we pray. Father, thank you again for a time that we have to spend in your word, for its availability to us, Lord, for your generosity in providing us with even two services on the Lord's Day, week in and week out. Lord, we've come to feed upon Christ, upon the grace and life and power that is in him, to have our minds enlightened in the knowledge of the truth, to have our affections lifted that they might love and desire what you love and desire, to have our wills loosened and directed. At the course of 
of our lives might be ever onward and upward in your kingdom ways as we are sustained on this pilgrim journey that leads to the celestial city. So, Lord, tonight, sustain us. Feed us with manna from above as we read, as we preach, and as we all here tonight come under the authority of your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. There was a certain man of Ramathim, of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Ohu, son of Zuth, and Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Ophni, and Phinehas were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she bowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Anna was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put the wine away from you. But Hannah answered, No, my lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord, Then they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. The man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine. And she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in your presence, praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. Thus far the reading of God's word. Well, tonight, brothers and sisters, we want to consider a couple of simple thoughts from this last part of 1 Samuel, which I believe should be a great encouragement to you. 
Interestingly enough, this passage uh, reflects a few oddities in the original Hebrew and Greek manuscripts of the Old Testament. There's a couple points where there are a couple different readings that may have bearing on the meaning of the passage. And uh, so just to anticipate, we'll, we'll mention those briefly here this evening. But here we have um, something of great significance, but we don't recognize the significance of it until we continue reading in Samuel and find another piece of information out. We have here one of the first things that's worth our notice is what Elkanah, Hannah's husband, says to her when she communicates to him her plan to wait until she's fully weaned the child and then bring him to the, the tabernacle and give her son to the Lord permanently at that point in time. And what does Elkanah say to her in verse 23? He says, do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. Uh, now that's the reading that we get from the a Masoretic text, which is another way of saying the original Hebrew texts, or the, the ones we believe are most uh, old and trustworthy. But there's also this reading um, in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and in one of the Syriac versions, where Elkanah says instead, only may the Lord establish your word. And many commentators, many scholars believe that the ESV reflects the Masoretic text, believe that's really the point that Elkanah is actually saying to his wife, okay, you can delay, just let's hope the Lord makes sure you're faithful to fulfill your vow. May the Lord establish your word to give Samuel to the tabernacle. But I believe it's, it's right, that's, it's possible, um, perhaps we can say both are true. <laughs> Perhaps both are true. If you turn with me to 1 Samuel 3, that passage that may be quite well known here, where the Lord speaks to Samuel as a young boy living in the tabernacle, the first verse of chapter 3 opens the passage with these words, that the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. Well, this shouldn't surprise us, should us? What day are we living in with Elkanah and Hannah? It is the day of the judges. It is a day when everyone did what was right in their own eyes, and the Lord left his people to their foolishness, to their own ways, to suffer the con miserable consequences of their sin. But then he would raise up a judge and deliver them, and this happened over and over again. It's, it shouldn't be too surprising to us that in this day and time, God's people were not familiar with his word. There was a lack of fruitfulness in their very way of life. Disobedience and idolatry characterized their lives. That makes perfect sense that the word of the Lord, him speaking to priest, prophet, judge, revealing his will for his people, and that being expressed through his chosen officers, his chosen servants to his people, that that would be a rarity. For we know, as we've learned from the parable of the sower and elsewhere in Scripture, the word of God produces life in God's people. The life of God himself in us. It's like a seed that's planted and has the potential of bringing forth even a hundredfold fruit. So the word of the Lord is rare there. Elkanah's interest may be a little uh, fuzzy to us. Is it that his wife will be faithful to her vow? Is it, is it this, though? That by fulfilling her vow, she is serving to help establish the Lord's word. What does it mean for her? If she does what is best to her and waits until she leaves him, only may the Lord establish his word. What would that actually entail? What would he actually be speaking? What would her part be in this? It would be what follows in the passage. So the woman weaned him, and she took him up with her, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And the child was young. They slaughtered the bull, they brought the child to Eli, and she said, here he is, I've lent him to the Lord. By fulfilling her vow, keeping her word in the Lord's power, here Hannah is actually making a contribution 
to the ministry of the word in the Old Testament church. This one whom the Lord would speak to, this one through whom the Lord would speak to, this one through whom the ministry of God's word among his people would be brought back, revived, reinstituted through a faithful servant. Samuel uh, plays the role of prophet in great measure, speaking on behalf of the Lord, serves in the tabernacle, serves as a judge, an interesting set of offices he inhabits. He was the kingmaker. He's the one who, through his word of anointing, through his ministry and the Lord's speaking to him, that we get both Saul, but then even more importantly, the kingship of David. To restore what we saw needed restoring in the book of Ruth, and that's the peace and righteousness of God's people under the banner of a righteous king's rule. The ministry of the word that comes forward from Samuel, the ministry of God speaking to him and him speaking to God's people and ministering in that capacity cannot be underestimated. How much of the renewal of Israel's life being brought out of that era of disorder, era of the judges, and into the era of a right, an era of greater righteousness, peace, and unity has to do with Samuel's own ministry. The ministry of God's word. A glorious, beautiful thing. Something worth desiring. The basis for ourselves, of our own hope and our own ministry here. God's word. That's where the fruitfulness comes from. This is the gift of Samuel. The result of the sacrifice made when he's brought to the temple. We need to keep that in view. Whether or not Elkanah meant your word or God's word, the result of the gift of Samuel to the Lord is the increase of the word of the Lord in Israel. That is for sure. Let's consider now the sacrifice of Samuel. Now this we can speak of in two ways. There is that sacrifice that accompanies his being given to the Lord that we read about here. In verse 24, when she had weaned him, she took him up with her along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine. Now, I'm not going to get into all the details of the sacrifices this evening, but uh, one of the other readings of this passage is instead of a three-year-old bull, uh, that it would be three bulls. There's some discrepancy among a couple manuscripts. Which one is it? Well, generally, we understand there's a sacrifice being made to honor the Lord at this juncture. A, a, the, the law is being fulfilled, but if it is three bulls, then we would see and understand here what's being offered would be a burnt sacrifice, which is a sacrifice to acknowledge your sinfulness, though not a sacrifice that's trying to atone for any particular sin that needs remedy, just a general sacrifice, giving the life over to God, recognizing um, the sacrifice needs to be made to be even brought into the presence of the Lord. The second sacrifice would have likely have been the one required of women after they gave birth to a child, especially a firstborn child, which belonged to the Lord. You remember in the old, um, <clears throat> back in Exodus, the Lord says, all the firstborn are mine. But instead of that, instead of I taking the firstborn out of every household, instead we'll just take the tribe of Levi, and that Levi will serve as a substitute priestly class instead of taking the first son of every household. Well, here in this instance, the first son is actually given to the Lord. And it's right that he serves in the temple. So this second bowl, if that's the right reading of the passage, would be likely uh, an offering made commemorating God's gift to this child and also at the same time offering some kind of purification regarding the childbirth and all that went on. Of course, that would be a little late but it's possible that that would still be an acceptable offering. The third one could possibly be here a peace offering, which would accompany the fulfillment of a vow. All we read in the early part of 1 Samuel 1 tonight, the vow that Hannah made in the presence of the Lord. And she took it seriously. And she needed to. And when she came to the Lord the next time, it was in fulfillment of the vow. Part of her constitution was to say, I'm not going to go back into the Lord's presence until I'm ready to finish the business that I committed myself to. And I'm going to wean him fully. I don't think we should necessarily see selfish interest there. That's for Samuel's benefit. So, of course, she delighted in that short season. And I'm going to bring him. And as soon as I bring him, 
He's going to be there and never leave. We're not going to go back and forth. When I give him to the Lord, he's going to be giving for good. And so a fulfillment of the vow here that she made before the Lord is also commemorated by the sacrifice. Uh, this honoring of the Lord. And the peace offering was one where the meat of the animal was uh, eaten by the priests representing the Lord and the person bringing the sacrifice. So there is a fellowship. It's also called the fellowship offering. There is this enjoyment of the relationship that's, that's depicted particularly. The burnt offering just entirely is on, it's often called the whole burnt offering because the whole animal is on the altar and it just goes up in smoke in representation of you ascending to the Lord. Right? Uh, but this peace offering, only portions would be burnt and other portions would be cooked and then you would eat of it in the presence of the Lord enjoying fellowship over a meal with God at this juncture. Peace. Keeping of a vow. So all of this certainly reveals to us the hearts of Hannah and Elkanah. They are submitted to the Lord. They're walking in his covenant ways. God is giving them grace to be faithful to his covenant law here. And even perform the right sacrifices at this time. Let's look at how Hannah, let's look at how Hannah then saw this gift of Samuel to her. Let's begin to consider the nature of the sacrifice to them subjectively, as people as we are. In verse 27, we read this from Hannah's lips as she brings this report to Eli, actually back in verse 26. Oh my Lord, she hasn't seen Eli since she offered that prayer that was confused for drunkenness. As you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed. Oh, he didn't know what the prayer was. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. But Eli had no idea what the prayer was when he blessed Hannah and said, May the Lord give to you what you requested. And here, it's better than he could have imagined. Another servant in the temple, a gift. Who would expect that? Here's someone who could be your protege from birth. You can raise him in the ways of the temple. You can care for him there. He will serve you. What a, what a gift. What a gift. But how does Hannah see him? Maybe it's the mothers here who can appreciate this best. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. God did this. I didn't do it myself. She knew that. But what does she say next? I've lent him to the Lord. I've given him to the Lord. Forever. A perpetual gift. I'm not going to take him back. Let's remember what Hannah and Elkanah would have enjoyed had they kept Samuel. He would have been essentially a life insurance policy for Hannah in the case of Elkanah's death. He would have been one to perpetuate Elkanah's name, to bring honor to him. It would have been pleasing to Hannah. It would have been one to inherit the estate and carry on the work that he did. Many earthly blessings to be had here, not to mention the joys of raising a child and being in that child's presence and investing in them and having all the memories that go along with parenting a child. It's hard to estimate how significant of a gift this is, how significant of a sacrifice this was. He would have been weaned at two to four years old. I think of my son, who just turned two. I cannot conceive of giving him away within a year or two. Hannah did this. Elkanah did this. They vowed to do it. They followed through by God's grace. Was it worth it? That's a big sacrifice. A big 
sacrifice for a barren woman finally receiving this gift. How much did her heart say? Yeah, I found that to the Lord, but oh, this is so sweet to have a son in my image. He's got my eyes. It's better than I thought it was going to be to nurse him, to care for him, to watch him begin to walk, to coo, to teach him his first words. Oh, I want to reconsider my vow. My very heart is here in this child. Maybe it was, but I'll kind of say, just to make sure the Lord establishes the promise you made. <laughs> what a gift. What a sacrifice this was. But not only for Hannah, for Alcana too. It's commonly understood by Jewish scholars. We don't see this necessarily in Scripture, but tradition tells us that ordinarily the pattern was that when a son was weaned, he kind of transferred from more motherly direct oversight to fatherly oversight. Now you're daddy's boy. You don't need mama so intimately, right? You can start eating regular food now, and there is a natural transition point, and I don't know what that looked like, perhaps, but essentially the idea here, then, is, is Samuel never gets transferred in the ordinary way to Alcana's care, but directly to Eli's care, the high priest. It's a picture of spiritual adoption. It's a picture of being handed over to the care of Eli instead of his own father. Clearly, you're a picture of God being his father, the Lord who begins then at a young age to speak to him at the tabernacle. And so he is, as it were, adopted by the Lord, given to his service. What a great sacrifice. What a wonderful gift Eli received. But let's ask again, for what? Was it really worth it? Hannah and Elkanah thought so. Eli thought so. We must think so too. What price tag would you put on the ministry of God's word among his people? The word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. Here's the promise of God's word coming back to the people. The word that gives not only life in the womb, but spiritual life. What would we give to have the Word of God faithfully proclaimed to us in a season where there is no Word? The people in this world, they don't know what they're missing when they don't have the Scriptures, when they don't have faithful preaching of God's Word. They are languishing whether they know it or not. Where do we get away from? if not from the seed of God's word that could be planted in their heart to bring forth the very life of Jesus Christ in them and the hope of eternal life, the assurance of God's love and grace, the warnings we all need to walk in his ways, direction, guidance, my word, God's word, it is still for life. Samuel's ministry represents the return of the word of the Lord to his people, and all of this here together certainly points our attention to the Lord Jesus Christ. We thought about this in Sunday school this morning, the threefold office of Christ, which is that Jesus serves as our king. He serves as our priest. And boys and girls, he also serves as our... What's that other one? It's the one we usually say first. Our prophet. Yes, he's the one who speaks God's word to us, reveals to us by his word and spirit his will for our salvation, God's will for our salvation. This is the ministry of Jesus Christ. Did his word need to come on the wings of sacrifice to you and me? Amen. It did. 
The word that you hear, brothers and sisters, you could not hear the word. Jesus offers salvation with God to you. The Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of his spirit, offers eternal life to you, forgiveness of sins to you, a justified status between you and God, peace, the power to resist temptation, the hope of eternal life, glory in paradise. All this is offered to you by the word of Christ the prophet through his messengers. Impossible to hear any of those words if he does not die, right? There is no good news. There is no word to share if the Savior does not die for our sins in our place. If, so to speak, for a season the Father, his real Father, does not entrust him to the adoptive care of Joseph. <laughs> oh, this points us to the sacrifice of Christ. We must say the sacrifice of Hannah and Elkanah offering up Samuel to Eli and to the Lord for the rekindling of the word of the Lord among God's people was worth it because we must say it was worth it what all of that points to and that's Christ offering up his own life that the word of his power, the word of his peace might then be sent by his spirit and his apostles and his prophets and through the word of God and his ordinary servants these days to you and to me. Does God wonder, ah, was it worth it that I sent my son to die for those people to hear my word? Does the son wonder, was it worth it that I did that for them so they could hear me? They're not always listening. Well, if Hannah and Elkanah does not, did not wonder whether it was worth they did not regret it, but knew it was a righteous and worthy cause, you can bet the Father and the Son never spend a minute, so to speak, regretting the sacrifice of Christ, that we might have many things, but certainly the Word, the Gospel. But how about you? How about me? I have two things to say here in final application. Firstly, we all need to always hear this in a passage like this. Sacrifice what you can for the word of the Lord. What sacrifices can you make for your own enjoyment of the word of the Lord and for others' enjoyment of the word of the Lord? What sacrifices do you need to make in order to receive it yourself, day in and day out, Lord's Day morning and evening? What sacrifices need you to make in order to help make that available to others? Maybe you need to be challenged to sacrifice more, or better put, to not regret the sacrifices you already make for the word of the Lord in our time and place. But I just say very personally here to those who are gathered, I know that you make many sacrifices for the word of the Lord. The Lord may know that you need to make more, or that you're resisting some that I am not aware of. But here you are tonight. Be encouraged. Okay? What sacrifices have you made to be here now for the sake of the word of the Lord in your own life? Don't regret them. What sacrifices do you make to your budget to support the ministry of this church. That God's word might go forward in this place. Don't regret those sacrifices that you make. Rejoice and know the Lord will use his word to build up his church to advance his kingdom. Don't regret any of the sacrifices you make, parents, to make time to come around the word of the Lord in your homes to ensure that your children are brought near to the gospel in your very home, or your grandchildren, or your neighbors, or whatever opportunities the Lord gives to you to make sure that others get access to the word of God. What sacrifice could be too much for that? Could there be a sacrifice too great so that others might hear the word of truth when our Savior gave his own life? No, may the Lord give us strength 
to continue to lay our lives down, that his people might have his word, and to live that way without regret. May we admire Hannah and Elkanah here and see the Spirit of God at work in them. May we see a reflection of God's love and light and power and be empowered in these ways. God's word, to have it, hmm, is worth giving up any earthly thing. And he's given to, to us free of charge. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the abundance of your word among us in this day and age. With the Bible in our language, multiple translations, theology books abounding in our language, Father, the word is so available to us. Here in this church, the word preached Sunday morning and evening, Sunday school taught before morning worship. Christians available to get together with to discuss the word of God. Lord, may we be a people who continue as we do, sacrificing, giving up earthly benefits and pleasures in order to get your word for ourselves and to ensure that others gain access to it as well. And may, Father God, we rejoice and glory in whatever sacrifices here we make. And may we never regret it. Thank you for the testimony of Hannah and Elkanah's lives. May our lives bear the same confidence and zeal. And may the fruitfulness of your word abound to your glory and praise. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Turn with me to number 538, 538, and let us sing together, Take My Life and Let It Be. Let's stand together. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing Always only for my King Take my lips and let them be Filled with messages from Thee Filled with messages from Thee Take my silver and my gold, not a might would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose, every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own, it shall be thy royal throne, it shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy 
my feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee, ever only all for thee. I receive the Lord's blessing, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs> Now the day is over, night is drawing nigh, shadows of the evening steal across the sky. Glory to the Father, glory to the Son, and to the blessed Spirit, whilst all ages run.